Well, this podcast is a bit off the cuff because last week, yes, I was I had a week off. I hurt myself. So I had a busy old week catching up with jobs that I couldn't do due to my arm. So I was wandering through the comments on YouTube and I found out there's a lot of questions. So I thought I'll take this opportunity in a podcast to answer a lot of them questions. So let's do it. You might have seen one of the latest videos of where I did the scrap cable. That was a waste of bleeding time. But I did ask a question about switching phases on a motor, on a three-phase motor. And a lot of people got it correct. If you switch two phases, yep, it's going to reverse the motor. It doesn't matter which phases you switch. You can switch L1, L2, L3. Whichever you switch round, yep, that is going to reverse the motor. So a lot of people got that right. Another question that I got on there is how much for a board change? Well, that's sort of how long's a piece of string. A board change can be, can be completely different for every single property. I have been to properties before where they say, right, can you just change the board, please? Well, hang about, changing the board's not going to solve your problem. It's more than likely the wiring that's a problem. If it's got old rubber-backed wiring, it's pointless changing it to RCD or RCBO board because them RCBOs are not going to work without an earth. So just changing the fuse board to a property sometimes, it's not going to make it work it's not going to solve your problem you basically want an electrician to fault find the problem of the reason that you're changing the fuse board especially if you're taking your change of board and they give you a price say yeah 750 quid and then you turn up and it's a three-phase board well that's going to be a lot more work involved and yeah 750 quid is not going to cover you changing a three-phase board with a sort of 60 70 circuits in it or something i would say a three-phase board is at least going to cost you around 1500 to two grand and that is obviously going to be on a commercial or industrial property. Another Clever Clogs left a comment on the YouTube channel that is, what is the green and yellow for? It seems to work without the green and yellow connected. Yes, it will work without the green and yellow connected, which is the earth or the CPC, whatever you want to call it. But that's there to trip the fuse to make the electricity stop flowing through that circuit if there's a fault. Yeah, I suppose you can say it will trip if you're, you short circuit it with a live and neutral. But that is what the earth said for as well. So you need the earth to protect the circuit. That's the whole reason of the green and yellow. And on one of my short form videos that I've put out on YouTube, it took me 60 seconds to repair the job. So someone said, so do you charge for 60 seconds of work means it took you 60 seconds to repair that job. And it's more like, like you found a plug socket in water or it was something simple. You just have to reset the RCD. Sometimes people get confused. The RCD, it won't reset, won't reset. Especially them MK ones. You've got to push it straight down and right back up to reset it. So yeah, it's 60 seconds after you've found the fault to sort of reset the RCD. But it's not necessarily 60 seconds on the job. They had to call you up. You had to answer the phone for wherever you were. Say you were 10 minutes away. It took you 10 minutes to get there. Another five minutes to get your kit out. And then to sort of assess the situation to see what's happened. Yeah, it's going to take you more than 60 seconds to actually do the work. So no, you're not going to charge 60 seconds for the job. Because I don't know, I don't know anyone that charges by the second. The minimum call-out charge for a lot of people is at least £75. So... If you're going to call an electrician up, expect to pay around £75 at least. Another comment I had about a video of smoke alarms. When I install a smoke alarm, yep, they were, it were all interconnected. Main smoke alarms need to be interconnected. So basically, if one goes off, they all go off, especially in a big property. Because if there's a fire in the kitchen, you want to know that there's a fire in the kitchen so it makes the smoke alarm go off in the bedroom. But someone said, if they all go off at the same time, how are you going to know where the fire is? Well, in my eyes, if it was my house, I wouldn't be interested where that fire was. I would get the hell out and call the fire brigade, let them do their job. Because you're not going to attack a fire if you've got a fire going on downstairs. You want to get out of the house. Fire spreads quite quick. So the smoke alarms are there to go off to notify you in that property that there's a fire. It doesn't necessarily have to go onto an app and say, right, it's uh, the kitchen smoke alarm going off. Right, I'll go down and check it out in the kitchen. What if you open the door to that kitchen and the flames sort of burn you to a cinder? We're not interested 
on where the fire is. We're interested that the uh, smoke alarms have detected the fire and it's warned us to get out of the property. That's the whole reason installing a smoke alarm system. Well, this next question is going to be from someone across the pond, basically in America. It says, blue cable, what are you installing? Three phase? Unfortunately, no. Three phase, yes, you will get. Oh, no, you don't use blue anymore. Sorry, that's uh, the old colours in the UK for three phase cable was red, yellow, blue. Yeah, L1, L2, L3. But then they changed to harmonised colours, which in three phase, it is brown, black and grey. L1, L2, L3. But then in single phase, we now have brown for live and blue for neutral. It is confusing without a doubt because on DC, it's different as well. You've got blue being the live on a DC system as well. It's quite confusing. But we've harmonised with Europe and with Ireland, basically. that They're all the same colours now. This happened in 2004. It used to be red and black cabling in the UK. But yeah, that's old hat now. So on three phase, the blue is a neutral. And on single phase, the blue is a neutral as well. And within a lot of the comments on my videos, people ask, they say, right, where did you, you get that? Like one of the comments said, where did you use that dust catcher that goes around the hole saw when you're drilling out down lights? Well, that is called a dade. If you listen to this podcast, you can go and find it on Amazon. There's a dade. But then also, if you check out the link tree, which I'll leave a link to it in the description below, that there is basically an Amazon shop with all the tools that I use. So if you see me in the videos using some tools, 90% of the time that they're going to be in that shop on Amazon, which I've created for you to find all the tools that I use that make your life easier as an electrician. Is it against the regs to run a socket off a lighting circuit? No, not at all. A lot of people do it. They do it for a TV amp, maybe in a, in a loft area. They put a socket up there just because it's a small amount of current you use for a TV amp. But the thing is, you got to remember that that, will be no good for you to plug your hoover in, anything like that. I've seen it before, where people have added extra sockets, but they've come off the lighting circuit because it's upstairs, and you can drop down from it easy enough. But then as soon as someone plugs their hoover into it, it's going to trip the lighting circuit off. If you're going to run a socket off of a lighting circuit, you're not going to be plugging in ovens or anything like that. You're going to be plugging in something that draws a small amount of current, like this, which is a phone charger or... A TV amp. Don't expect to be wiring off your uh, wiring your new loft conversion off of the lighting circuit. It's not going to happen, especially when you go and plug your Hoover in up there, your toaster, or some crazy son of a gun will more than likely run a shower off the lighting circuit. Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's going to trip, trip, trip the fuse all the time, and it will do its job. Don't be one of these people that think, oh, if it's tripping, the only thing you need to do is upgrade the fuse. No, you cannot upgrade the fuse. The fuse is there for a reason. On a 1 mil cable or a six, uh, 1.5 cable, you're going to have like a 6 amp fuse or a 10 amp fuse, depending on what size cable it is. This is the whole reason you need an electrician to do the job. If you get an electrician, a qualified, decent electrician to do the job, it's going to know which size fuse is suitable for that cable. So yeah, get a sparky, mate. You can run a socket, but you ain't going to be plugging in toasters or cookers or hoovers into that socket. And with one of my videos where I did a damaged cable, and they said, what if the neutral gets damaged? Will the cable still be live? Yes. If you can cut a neutral on a cable and the live current will still go through it. Just because it's lost its neutral, that RCBO is not going to trip. And the thing is with a circuit as well, especially lighting circuit, if it's lost its neutral, it's not going to work. So this is a whole reason you test to start with. If you go around to a property with a fault, saying, oh, yeah, the lighting circuit, it doesn't work, but the fuse is on, more than likely you've lost a neutral. The thing is that a lot of people on a lighting circuit, a lot of people don't understand that the neutral is a carry-on feed for the whole of the downstairs lighting. So maybe the light doesn't work in the utility room at the back of the house but they work at the front of the house. More than likely, there's a neutral somewhere. If you go to that light, if, if I've done it before. I've gone to a customer's house where they say, yeah, I'll put this uh, new light up in the living room, but now the kitchen lights don't work. But the office lights work. So, okay. So you can see where they've took the light down, take it down, you see that they've mixed up the neutrals or not even connected it more than likely. If you 
disconnect a light fitting, maybe take a photo so you can put it back up the same way because that is a carry-on feed for your neutrals onto of the, of the whole circuit. So yes, if a neutral is broken, the live will still be live, carrying 240, 240 volts that will shock you. Someone's asked, where is the big money in the Sparky world? And personally, I would say that the big money is basically everywhere. You could earn a decent amount of money doing domestics, industrial, commercial, and even with solar panels or with EV chargers. There is plenty of work out there. I don't care what people say, saying it's calmed down, it's slowed down, and works tight on the ground. If you establish yourself in a good position to have a constant flow of work where people, if they need electricians, people always need electricians. This is the thing. If something goes wrong, if the internet goes off, they're going to call a sparky. If the power goes off to something, people need it. It doesn't matter if they haven't got any money because a lot of the time in industrial commercial, if the electric goes off, their business goes down. So they're going to need an electrician to come out and fix it to keep their business to run, keep their business running even, and to be able to earn money to pay the sparky basically to keep things efficient to keep them going it's the same with testing a lot of industrial commercial even letting agencies now are getting properties tested to make sure that things don't go down well this is what we get plenty of work from as well there is a lot of work for electricians basically on the world it's only getting bigger and better basically with smart lighting everyone wants his smart lighting now they're there they're everywhere and with ev charges with solar panels with wind turbines there's a lot of work out there for electricians so whatever you choose to go into as an electrician whether you go into ev charges whether you go into wind turbines you can make a lot of money, I think, as a decent electrician and building a decent business as an electrician in any aspect. Just for example as well, if you concentrate on doing maybe TV installs. I know a guy that basically puts TVs on the wall. He puts them nice, flush and beautiful. There's a few guys on the internet that do it. And they're electricians because it's cabling again. I don't know, my eyes, I see that as quite a simple job to do. But they're perfectionists. They get that TV on the wall um, with a coaxial to it and with a Wi-Fi to it. And it all works perfectly with no cables going down the middle of the wall, which it looks beautiful. So they've made a business out of just installing TVs on the wall and a good living out of it as well. So it doesn't matter what you do as an electrician. If you put the effort in to build that business, you're going to earn good money. Someone's asked, how do you incorporate a labourer into your daily rate? Well, basically, say you charge yourself out as, I don't know, say £300 a day. And then you're paying the labourer, what, £120 a day or, I don't know, 100 quid a day. Depends how good that labourer is. Say 150 quid a day. Then your daily rate now is 450 quid. It's as simple as that. In some scenarios where you're required on industrial and commercial to have basically a labourer and you've got to have someone there for health and safety reasons. I've done it before where I've had to take someone with me. All they do is drive maybe or carry the tools a little bit and you get maybe £150 you've got to pay them to come with you. They know they're not doing much but legally you have to have them with you. So on that invoice I will charge for two men basically not for an electrician and Well, not for two electricians, but maybe an electrician and a labourer. So the labourer will be sort of £170, where I will pay the labourer £150. But because I've got the tools and got them the work, I make a little bit off that labourer as well. So it all depends on how you want to work it. For maybe a domestic uh, premises, when you're being a domestic electrician, where you've got a job and you have a labourer with you to do the work, then possibly you don't make as much. But industrial commercial, where you have to have some like two men job there, especially if you're on a cherry picker or a scissor lift, you've got to have two guys on it, then you need to have someone there and they don't need to be very qualified. It's just a labourer, basically, tool carrier. Someone's asked as well, have you ever come across in a 1940s house where you've got two switches controlling one ceiling rose and in them switches there's basically two cables? Yes, I have, without a doubt. Sometimes they're confusing as well, because someone more than likely... I've done it a lot of times, where someone's changed the light in the hallway, and it's two-way switched. 
And they're saying, I'll put all the reds together, I'll put all the blacks together. You've just completely messed up the two-way switching. So you've got to bail them out. Back in the day, I think, they wired things differently. Without a doubt, they're wired. They're like wiring for electrician advances all the time. Especially if you've seen a few of my videos where now I run a four-core, well, sorry, three-core down to the switch to be able to cater for maybe smart lighting later on. So things are evolving over time. But back in the 1940s, I wasn't taught it at college on how these wiring system works. But as an electrician, you take it upon yourself to figure it out. There is some weird and wonderful ways of which people can actually wire lighting circuits and actually make them work. Yeah, some ding bat put on there as well. Why don't you test the circuit with your tongue to see if it's live? Well, one reason for that, mate, and one reason only. Because you'll blow your bleeding head off. I'm assuming this question is from a young lad that's basically been through college and he's nearly qualified as an electrician, but he can't find any work. And he says no one's willing to give him the experience. Yes, I do see this as a bit of a big problem. A lot of people, companies don't want to give people the experience because you're not qualified yet. I'm not going to pay you as an electrician. Then if you're not qualified yet, but you're nearly there, you're getting there and you need the experience, keep trying. Keep applying for companies. Basically, if you do one or two a day and you get to 100 by the end of, I don't know, a couple of months whilst you're training, all you need is one person to say yeah. And there will be someone out there that will say yeah, we'll give you a go. And once they say yes and give you a go, make sure that you don't lose that opportunity. Make sure that you're handy, you're willing to learn. And even if you're good at second fiction, you go, right, mate, leave it to me. I'll get my second fixing done. I'll leave the sockets off so you can have a little check. So then that extols the confidence in the electrician that you're good at a few jobs. And then the more jobs that they can give you to do, the more handy you are to, to them and they're gonna keep you on as an electrician and then once you're fully qualified yep yeah, they might say right yeah i want to keep you now i'll pay you as an electrician i'll um keep you on the company but then later on yep yeah, you might want to bridge away and do your own thing but it's the experience is what is so valuable so do your best to get on site and do some work with an electrician you'll learn so much more experience unfortunately you can't learn in college well, this next question someone's asked that oh, this is what I do. A lot of people don't. When you do a rewire, do you pull the old cables out or leave them in? I pull them out for two reasons. One of them, sometimes I use them as a draw wire to pull new cables in, especially on a lighting circuit. I've done it before in the loft where you think, oh, I don't really want to be running around that loft too much and poking the cables through in the new lighting positions. I'll use the old cables as a draw wire to pull the new ones in. But I was just with a property maybe yesterday or so, I think, that it's still got the rubber cable clipped to the side of the joists. And yeah, I can understand people didn't want to pull it out. Maybe it was stuck in there and stuff. It's all brittle. It's interesting to see sometimes at how long it's been in there. And it's obviously too cool with no earth. But yeah, some people, they do leave old cables in. And I suppose sometimes it's either make a lot more mess by pulling all them old cables out or have the choice of leaving, leaving them in. Well, the other reason why I take them out as well is because I like scrapping them in. You get a couple of quid for them. Like every time I do a job, I take the scrap cable and put it into a bucket in the van. Every month or so, probably get 20 quid. Well, 20 quid is 20 quid at the end of the day. It's a little bit more. Now this question, I do get asked a lot. I don't know why. But people say, are you actually an electrician or did you do the six-week wonder course in 2018? No, I did an apprenticeship in, I'm going to say 2000, 2001 possibly, and then qualified in 2000 and 2003, started up on my own in 2004. So, yeah, I did an apprenticeship as an electrician Back in the day, I worked for someone and I'm a fully qualified electrician, not a DIY Dave, like a lot of people suggest. But the apprenticeship is not the only way you can become an electrician. Check out this next podcast to find out how you can become an electrician if you're training to. And there's plenty of other episodes on the podcast that will help you in building your own business as an electrician. And let me know in the comments... Whether you like this type of podcast, whether you like me answering the questions, whether they're valuable to you or anything like that. And maybe I'll do some more in the future.
So until next time, see you again.